we were highly unlikely to ever own a company that we, we thought systematically was deploying capital poorly. It's one of the most important things along with management quality, organic growth, industry structure, and whether the company has secular challenges or doesn't have secular challenges. Part two of our interview with great investor David Giroux on why understanding capital allocation is such an important part of his investment success. He's next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and women investing in security and education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. When was the last time you heard an investment discussion about capital allocation and what difference it makes to investment results? Well, it is not a widely discussed strategy on Wall Street or in the financial press. First of all, what is it? According to Investopedia, capital allocation is the process of allocating financial resources to different areas of a business to increase efficiency and maximize profits. These decisions are made by the management team and boards of companies. They include decisions like building a new plant, expanding into a new market or geography, increasing or decreasing the research and development budget, making an acquisition, paying a dividend, and repurchasing shares. The lack of attention being paid to capital allocation decisions by companies has bothered this week's guest for years, so he decided to write a book about it. It's titled Capital Allocation, Principles, Strategies, and Processes for Creating Long-Term Shareholder Value. He is great investor David Giroux, Chief Investment Officer and Head of Investment Strategy for T. Rowe Price Investment Management and the portfolio manager of T. Rowe Price's Capital Appreciation Fund, which he has run since 2006. If you saw part one of my recent interview with him, available on WealthTrack.com, you know that Morningstar calls him one of the best in the business and a preeminent investor at the top of his game. Since inception, Capital Appreciation Fund has more than met its long-term goals of matching the absolute returns of the S&P 500 with substantially less risk. As Morningstar says, he has done it by relying on savvy stock picks to spur the fund's performance. A major part of Giroux's process of picking stocks is analyzing how they allocate capital. I asked him why it was so important. What, what I would tell you is I think the academic record, the historical record, would say that most companies kind of fail at capital allocation. Most companies uh, allocate capital suboptimally. And we are in a slower growth world, probably long term. And so the, the value that that especially mature companies that have excess capital, the returns that they achieve on that, uh, how they use capital allocation to alter their business for the better or worse, becomes a really important part of whether they're going to be successful going forward or less successful or not successful at all. Capital allocation is a very difficult topic. It's something that most boards, most managers struggle at. They don't have a knowledge base. There's not a lot of capital allocation experts on most boards. Part of the purpose of even writing the book was to you know, basically give companies kind of a how-to guide, an owner's manual for how to deploy capital wisely and use a lot of examples of companies that have done it exceedingly well over time. Many companies which I've invested on, with uh, or partnered with in many cases on a long-term basis. How important is capital allocation to you in your analysis of the companies that you're going to invest in? It's one of the most important things we, we focus on. If I go back to when I was an industrials analyst, you know, back in the early 2000s, uh, and looking at companies, what was interesting is those industrial companies, they all kind of grew at the same kind of organic growth rate. And the market was very, very focused on that organic growth rate. Some companies were three baggers and some companies fell 50 percent over that period of time. And the difference really was the companies that deployed capital well, the Ropers, the Danahers, the Amatex, they were big winners because they got great returns on their deals and their businesses got better. Companies that deployed capital poorly, the GEs, the Textrons of the world, were really bad stocks, even though they all had the kind of the same organic growth rate. And so that learning as an industrials analyst taking that, that learning as a, to a portfolio manager uh, since 2006 and basically trying to align myself, uh, partner with those companies that deploy capital 
the most wisely, uh, whether it be an AutoZone historically, a Pfizer, uh, Roper, uh, Danaher, and Thermo Fisher, Perkin Elmer, these companies that deploy capital exceedingly well, make large bets in a concentrated portfolio, you kind of just get out of their way in many respects and, and allow the, the value creation that they create for their companies and for our shareholders to, uh, to drop to the bottom line, if you will. How quickly can you figure out whether or not a company is a good capital allocator or not? It's actually relatively simple, actually. You can kind of look at the deal the companies have done. You can kind of do your own assumptions about kind of the margins and the, and the growth rate. It's very easy in many cases to say, what kind of return on capital is that billion dollars that's going to be just deployed on a share repurchase program or a capital spending program or an acquisition? What kind of return are they likely to have? And you know, there's some cases you find situations where companies spent a lot of money, don't get a lot of return, or in some cases spend a lot of money and the business becomes worse as a result of that. Uh, so I think it's actually relatively easy to, to d distinguish between good capital allocators and bad capital allocators. But how quickly can you determine that? Part of it is looking back in time and right. judging the decisions that they have made historically about cap allocation. In many cases, talk to them about how they think about cap allocation, the return thresholds they set, and whether they're consistently achieving those thresholds. And that's really important. Uh, it's kind of the important questions we have when we have a, a management discussion, not about what's going on in the short term, but you know, how are we trying to think about capital allocation? How, how, how are they creating value? What is the arbitrage that they're taking advantage of from a supply demand imbalance to create value in M&A or share repurchase where others are struggling for, for, from that perspective? You mentioned a number of companies that you said were good capital allocators and a number that were not. What, what company kind of epitomizes a company that does it really well? Well, I think probably the, the, the poster child for cap allocation is probably Danaher. Which has been a, a major holding in your capital appreciation fund for a number of years. Yes, we, we've owned it for, for uh, back since I think 2007, we've owned Danaher. What they've done is they, they, they run their businesses extraordinarily well, they take market share, they improve margins, they do all that really well, and they generate a lot of free cash flow. They take that cash flow and they make acquisitions that, that usually have faster organic growth rates than the core business, typically have lower cyclicality than the core business. So they, they're buying and maybe even better secular trends than the core business. And over time, the company evolves from what many years ago was a low single digit kind of organic growth company uh, with a lot of cyclicality to what we see today in Danaher which is a high single digit kind of growth business with minimal cyclicality, very high, very, very attractive long-term secular trends. And that's why the company's multiple has expanded so much over time as they improve the quality of the business. So not only getting good returns on the capital you deploy, but fundamentally changing the mix of your company to a better mix over time. That's what Danher's done. That's what Roper's done. That's what Perkin Elmer's done. That's what Thermo's done. And then it just created a lot of value. That's where, that's where you get these really unique situations where you get nice earnings growth, nice cash flow growth, but also multiple expansion. That's kind of the double whammy of a kind of total shareholder return potential when you, you, get, you marry good capital allocation with good management teams. So I'm thinking in the case of Danaher, for instance, that has, it sounds like the history of good capital allocation decisions have continued even with changes in, in CEO. Larry Culp was there a number of years ago. He's now at GE. And it is, does it become inculcated into the culture? Does it become institutionalized? It usually does. I think it's a great point. You know, Danner's had, I think, we're, since I've been, uh, I used to cover Danner as an analyst. So I, we've had four CEOs uh, during my tenure as an analyst and as a portfolio manager covering this stock. And cap allocation has, it's evolved a little bit. It's changed a little bit. What they emphasize, uh, in terms of longer term returns versus shorter term returns, maybe it's changed a little bit, but capitalization has consistently been good throughout all those different regimes of management teams. What I would also say, there is a, almost an autocorrelation, if you will. Companies that deploy capital well continue to deploy capital well. Companies that deploy capital poorly tend to consistently uh, deploy capital poorly in the future. That's interesting. And you mentioned some companies that were poor capital allocators. What's the company that is kind of the poster child for not allocating their capital well? 
Well, unfortunately, the poster child for deploying capital poorly was really General Electric during the MLT era, unfortunately. And right. that was a situation where you, you saw systematically paying up for businesses, failing to integrate them well, in many cases, divesting them years later for a lower price than you paid, uh, buying back stock at inopportune times at high valuations. And you know, again, we, we talk about this a little bit in the book, but you know, probably hundreds of billions of dollars of value destruction for shareholders as well as stakeholders in the process. You know, pensioners, communities, right. workers who had a lot of stock in GE, all really hurt by that. So you know, good capital allocation can benefit shareholders, but I think it also benefits a lot of stakeholders as well. Uh, and I think the market doesn't think about that as en enough, I think. I, I will mention in the case of a, a company continuing to be a bad capital allocator, that General Electric has new management with Larry Culp. Uh, the capital appreciation fund that you run is, is invested in General Electric. So you can change that and become a better capital allocator, right, with new management. What breaks that streak, sometimes an activist, sometimes it's mm -hmm. a new management team, that you kind of break that streak, right? Capital allocation at, 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 at GE for the last couple of years has really been about reinvesting in R&D, reinvesting in Salesforce, uh, refocusing on cash, and paying down a lot of debt. Because unfortunately, Larry and team, when they got there, they had way too much debt. So now we're in a much better spot where we can kind of talk about fundamentals without having to worry about the, the balance sheet. And the next phase of that hopefully will be more, more M&A, more share repurchase, more dividends, more traditional capital allocation. Why is the average company uh, so poor at proper capital allocation? I'd say two things. It's not easy, and it's not intuitive, I think. And, and maybe three, there's not a lot of experts on capital allocation on boards today. When I give presentation to boards, which I do quite a bit these days, you know, one of the things that I, I talk to them about is the difference between strategy and returns. And the good companies that, that, that deploy capital really smartly, really well, these are companies that, uh, that do deals for strategic reasons, but also get good returns, right? So I think sometimes there's a, there's a sense if you're a, on a board that, oh, this acquisition is strategic. It gets us into a new market, new geography. That's the answer. If you do that, but you get poor returns on it, that's not a great outcome for, for, for anybody, and, uh, right. especially for shareholders. And so, especially if you have to take a write-off on it, you know, years into the future. So trying to make sure you find the right acquisitions that make your company better, that are strategic, but at the same time generate good returns that, again, when done well, that can generate nice earnings growth, nice free cash flow growth, but also multiple expansion as your business gets better over time. Is there another company in addition to Danaher that does it well, that makes good acquisitions? And, and because, again, the track record of many companies in their mergers and acquisitions activities is poor. You know, I think the other company, it's actually in the same, uh, same sector as Thermo Fisher Scientific, mm -hmm. run by Mark Casper, a very large holding uh, of mine today, a very large holding for over, over 10 years now in the cap appreciation strategy. And again, I think what Mark's done over time is actually kind of counter cyclically deploy capital. Again, one of the reasons why capital allocation is so poor is because companies buy back stock at market peaks. And then when the market goes right. down, they, they don't buy stock. Energy companies spend a lot on capital at the peak, and then they pull back in, in, in a downturn, right? So most companies invest capital kind of pro cyclicality, or have pro cyclically, if you will. Mark's done a really great job at Thermo kind of doing it counter cyclically. So, Bought back a lot of stock uh, at Thermo at a time where the stock was trading at low multiple, back in kind of that 2009, 2012 period of time. Bought back, bought Life Technologies in 2014 when Life's business was temporarily depressed, growing 2%, and, and, it's, and, and he's been able to rebound the growth to kind of 7 or 8% over time, but bought it at a very, very low valuation because it's a little bit out of favor. Uh, either growing 2, they had been growing 7, he paid 13 times for an asset that's probably worth 20 times. And he's, he's consistently kind of gotten very good returns on deals, consistently increased the organic growth rate of the company through acquisitions. And again, another example, like Danaher, of just multiple expansion, nice earnings growth, good operational discipline, great management team. So again, a core holding for the uh, cap appreciation strategy. 
two other of the biggest capital appreciation strategies that most of us are familiar with are share repurchases mm -hmm. and also dividends. So uh, talk to us about share repurchases, which as you know, has come under some political flack <laughs> uh, for basically benefiting you know, management and benefiting shareholders, but not benefiting the other broader uh, field of other stakeholders. I would just say most of the arguments against share repurchase that it hurts R&D, it helps EPS, it benefits uh, executives, uh, it hurts, you know, all, all the kind of, the, you know, it hurts workers' comp, all those kind of mm -hmm. arguments that you see yeah, we, we kind of debunk those in the uh, in the book, and I would you say do. so. Debunk them for us now, in, in the you know kind of the executive summary. Sure. Well, let's just talk about R and D. R and D is the the thing. So where Sherry Purchase takes money away from R and D. Sherry Purchase came really came about in the early '80s. The R and D as percentage of GDP has been, especially corporate funded R and D, has been growing at a very very healthy clip, faster than GDP. It's been taking share within GDP ever since Sherry Purchase came. On, on the scene, right? And today, corporate R&D is greater in the US than it is in Europe, where we have less share repurchase. It's greater than it is in China, where we have basically no share repurchase. So the R&D argument really doesn't make a lot of sense. In terms of the question that you ask about, is this benefiting shareholders at the expense of workers or other, other stakeholders in an organization? I would tell you, if you, today, you said we cannot do share repurchase. One of the things we would have happen, we'd probably see more M&A. More M&A involves downsizing. It involves someone buying a company, taking costs out, and taking costs out usually is people costs. Right. So if, if I announce a billion dollar share repurchase at a company tomorrow, no one's worried about anything. I, I don't have to put my, I don't have to worry about, I'm gonna lose my job. But boy, if, you know, if you do a billion dollar acquisition that has a lot of synergies involved, boy, that's probably going to be thousands of people maybe losing their, their jobs. So from a societal perspective, the alternative to share repurchase is more consolidation, more oligopolistic pricing structures, and you know, probably more job loss, obviously, as well. So I think that argument that share repurchase is better for all stakeholders is really not supported by the, by the facts. And again, the share repurchasing that a lot of companies do, as you said, they buy high. Market timing is another issue, which is part of the, your capital allocation mission, is to, uh, to educate managers and board members on that there are good times to make share repurchases, and there are times that are not great times. And there's some companies that share repurchase makes a lot of sense, and some companies, companies that are highly cyclical businesses, companies that are under secular challenge, they shouldn't be buying back their stock. They should be doing special dividends, or paying you know, a reasonable level of regular dividends. So there are certain companies that have a horrible track record. Certain industries, like energy, have horrible track record when it comes to buying back stock. Right. Dividends. Uh, so are, are there companies that paying dividends are appropriate, others that are not? Is it generally a, a good use of a company's resources? So it depends. We kind of think about what is the return an investor is getting by if they take those dividends a company gives them and redeploys that in the equity market. What is the kind of the cash on cash return? How does that return look relative to buying back stock or doing acquisitions? So a company that is trading at a very attractive valuation should probably be doing more share repurchase than dividends. A company that trades at a high valuation should probably be doing a little more dividends and a little less share repurchase. A company that can do a lot of M&A and generate a lot of value like Danaher, Roper, Thermo, probably shouldn't be doing a lot of dividends and should be buying and should be doing a lot of M&A. So the whole point of, of all these different alternatives, is go where the best returns are, where's mm -hmm. the best risk risk return. And that depends on your, your ability to do M&A, depends on your market environment, depends on your, what your shareholders kind of want. Where are the returns the greatest is where you should be deploying your, your time and your capital. And David, what about paying off debt? There, there are certain companies in the case of GE, right, we talked about GE earlier. Uh, GE is a company that was way too levered. It would made, even though GE was undervalued, didn't make any sense for GE to go buy, and buy, go buy stock or, or you know, pay large dividends or go do M&A, right? Priority number one for any company is making sure your balance sheet is strong, strong enough to survive a market downturn, right? Now, for some companies, if you're heavily cyclical, you're an auto, comp, auto OEM, you're an airline, you probably shouldn't have any debt. But boy, if you're a 
if you're a tower company or you're a fast food franchisee, uh, company like, like Yum Brands, you probably should be levered three to four or five times, right? So the level of debt you should have is directly related to the amount of volatility of your cash flows and their sensitivity to a market or industry specific downturn. From an investment point of view, when you look at a company or, and when an individual investor looks at a company, if they're invested in individual companies, where do you rank uh, capital allocation as far as the aspects of a company that you look at to determine whether or not you're going to invest in it? We run a very concentrated portfolio. Like we, we you know, we, right. we, we don't, there, there are not that many great companies out there. And so we can have really high standards because we own 40 stocks instead of 150 stocks. And so if you don't deploy capital well, we're not going to invest with you, right? If you mm -hmm. look at almost every company in our portfolio, we would kind of give them an A or A minus on a capital allocation framework. There's a lot of companies in that SP 500, we would not rate A's. We're highly unlikely to ever own a company that we, we thought systematically was deploying capital uh, poorly. Uh, it's such an important part of how we think about investing, how our arbitrage versus the market. So, you know, it, it's, it's one of the most important things along with management quality, organic growth, industry structure, and whether the company has secular challenges or doesn't have secular challenges. You know, you, you mentioned that there are very, uh, very few good capital allocators on company boards or in management. It's, it just is not a specialty. I mean, should it be? It sh I mean, should there be graduate courses in capital allocation, or how do you how do you <laughs> rectify <laughs> that deficit? Well, in all honesty, you know, I, I've, I've wrestled with this question a, long, a lot. Should we basically have more boards with more professional investors on the boards? Should we? have more CFOs on the boards than we have CEOs today. I've, I've wrestled with this question, but I think the way I've come down on this point is, or this issue is, people should honestly just read the book and actually spend more time about thinking about capital allocation. How do you create value? Looking at the examples of companies that have done an incredible job on capital allocation. And as a result of that, I think they'll become, they would be better capital allocators in the future. I think that's how we've kind of thought about that. Right. All right. So, so we're not going to start a graduate, the uh, David Giroux Graduate <laughs> School of Capital <laughs> Allocation. Not yet. Not yet. One investment for a long-term diversified portfolio based on our conversation about the importance of capital allocation. Is there, you know, one investment that we should all own some of, David? Yeah, I'd say one name that I think has done an incredible job, even more recently on capital allocation, would be Texas Instruments. Uh, Texas Instruments was, is a semiconductor company, uh, high quality analog semiconductor company, has very, very high gross margins. Again, a, somewhat of a pure play on, on the uh, increasing electrification of cars, industrial equipment, healthcare equipment, where you see more sensors, more semiconductors. So again, a, a business that should probably grow over time in kind of the mid to high single digits over time from an organic growth perspective. But they've done an incredible job with capital allocation. Again, back in 2010, they made an acquisition of a company at a very low valuation, create a lot of value, increase their industrial exposure. Uh, they've been buying back stock really for the last 15 plus years. And then actually this year, or actually a couple of years ago, they made a little bit of a transition. And they decided, said, you know, there's not enough capacity to make analog semiconductors in this country. And they started building new plants here, many in, in Texas right now. And that, some of that capacity is going to come on online right at the same time where there's kind of the shortage and where a lot of companies are a little bit less comfortable uh, buying semiconductors out of China. And so Texas Instruments is going to have a whole bunch of new fabs ready to produce analog semiconductors in the U.S. And I think that their, their timing of that is going to be really, really good. I think they'll be able to take a lot of market share as a result of that. And then you pass the CHIPS Act, which again benefits them by lowering their cost. So right. maybe a little lucky on the last part, but really smart long-term thinkers. Also a company that did not buy, buy back a lot of stock last year, but this year when the stocks come down, being very, very aggressive. Again, the opposite of what we talked about before with buying your stock high, and in this case, buying your stock low, which we love. Texas Instruments, again, one of the, your, the holdings in your capital appreciation fund, they must be listening to you, David Giroux. <laughs> I'm listening to them. They're a great example. Thanks so much for joining us and congratulations on capital allocation, David. All right, thank you. 
At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is read David Giroux's capital allocation. First of all, he is a great investor, so learning how he analyzes companies is fascinating. It is chock full of anecdotes, examples, and detailed analysis of major companies, both well-managed and not, that are worth learning about because you probably own some of them in your portfolio. It is also written in a clear and easily understood style with helpful and simple charts. Capital allocation is especially valuable for serious investors, company CEOs, and board members, but it is also an education for the rest of us. It's an area I will now pay much more attention to as an investor and journalist. Next week, award-winning personal finance journalist Jonathan Clements has personal and financial advice for living through inflationary times. In this week's extra feature, the incredibly busy David Giroux explains how he found the time to write capital allocation. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thank you for taking the time to join us on Wealth Track. Have an invigorating weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one. Thank you.